All right, I'm hitting that magic go live button. Mm -hmm. It says we're live. Is it true? Now I believe it. And it says preview still. That little hunker. Okay, there he goes. We are live for real. All right. Well, hello. Um, I am Kat Udero, psychic empath and psychic wrangler. So welcome to Third Eye Salon. If you've not been here before, we are so pleased that you are here. And for those of you who are repeat offenders or blessers, um, we are always so happy to have you here and in the live stream chat with us. It makes it so much of a richer experience. Um, in each and every show, we look between the veils of reality, and today is no different. We are looking between the veils of the ET soul known as Don Anderson, and as, as he shares his lifelong experiences um, with a whole host of ET or star beings. So before we say hello to Don, though, I will flip this into Brady Bunch of you. I'm going to remember this time. We're going to say hello to the co-hostess with the mostest. It's Linda Coulter-Burge. How are you, Linda? I am doing well. Welcome, everybody. I am going to be your live stream chat host. And as always, my policy is to play nice or get out. We just don't have time for meanness here. So curiosity is always welcome. Make sure through this that you like, share. The sooner you do it, the better. Subscribe if you haven't hit that like button, then hit the, the subscribe button. And uh, then you can be notified. Um, also, check out our podcasts on Spotify. And I just went like... Um, <laughs> Yeah, Spotify, Apple, they're, they're Apple. really kind of on all of them. They should all okay. be on all of them, but yeah. Yay. And if you go there, make sure you like us there too, because it helps with the algorithms. Algorithms. However yes, you want to say coffee. it, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who have bought us coffee, thank you. Thank you so much. And for those of you who have hit the likes, thank you. It helps. Everything helps. Um, make sure you've joined our Facebook group if you haven't. And with that, Don, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for having me this morning. For me, it's morning. So, yes. Mm. I think we're on morning zone still currently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're excited to have you here. You're on the you're on the coast with Linda, right? In Oregon? Yes, that's correct. Just outside of Portland. See, so you two are going to have to hobnob. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Before we get into Mr. Don's bio, though, we want to say hello to Jason Adkins. And uh, he is a channeler of your ET guides and fractal family. He's also an incredible psychic medium. How are you, Jason? Doing well. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Um, I had actually it was interesting when you shared Don's interview with Preston. I went to watch it and I was like, I've already watched this. Um, ah. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm excited. The game. I'm excited for today. Yeah. Nice. So a little a little tech tip we missed earlier. Your your mic is rubbing that zipper like it likes to do. So okay. just be careful. You're Will never do. bad. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, all right. And then uh before we get into Mr. Don's bio. Um, I want to let you know that um, we have been blessed to be accepted as an affiliate for Surfshark. So I've been using it for two years and their, their VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network. And what it does is it protects all of your devices from viruses, malware, data leaks, and privacy threats from one account. So if you have a tablet, you've got your laptop, you've got your phone from all your from one account, all your, your devices are protected. And yeah, I've been using it for two years. I freaking love it. They have an amazing deal. 84% off for the first 26 months if you sign up with the link below and then two months for free. So you can try it for two months for free before you, you know, and then cancel if you don't like it. It's, it's, but I love it. I highly recommend. Um, you probably won't cancel. Um, anyway, we're move forward to Don's bio. I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs from it. The whole bio is down below in the link uh, or in the description box below. So Don Anderson was born in Glendale, California in 1959, but very early in life, he moved to a rural farming community in Utah where his mother and younger brother lived for a good part of his life after his father passed away. He always believed the homes they lived in were haunted only to discover that they were um, not as a result of spirit hauntings, but numerous abduction and contact experiences, which only increased in frequency and intensity as he grew older. Then one night in the summer of 1984, as a single parent himself to a young boy, they both were taken, both of them were taken from their room and carried through a beam onto a craft, which was floating in the air across the street from their home. When he was placed back in his bed after the event, he immediately had an instant recall of a lifetime of past contact experiences 
which included watching himself being escorted into the delivery room where he was being born with a gray being who was reminding him to not forget who he was. So this is how we know that Don is an ET soul. So you can read the full bio below, but let's get into it, Don. Um, I kind of want to really start with your experiences as a kid, because, you know, you talk about when we did our pre-show talk, you really refer to your mom as Judy, because <laughs> there's yeah. not really a genetic connection there. Would you kind of walk us through that? You maybe your early experiences with Judy and oh. how you're like, she's not really my mom. Yeah, it was my childhood was a little bit different off the wall just because of those experiences. But, uh, you know, I would try to tell her about, well, take this one, for instance, we we're driving down the road one day, we stopped off at a gas station, this little rural it was just this little rural gas station out in the middle of nowhere. And off to the side, there's a great big army truck. It was, it was just huge. It was one of those low riders and it had a round object on the truck that was covered. And I looked at it and I freaked out and I says, Hey, that's where the ghosts live. You know? And she looked at me, she says, stop that nonsense. Don't talk like that at all. I said, no mom, that's where the ghosts live. The ghosts are living in that ship. You know, I was only, I remember this so well and I was only four years old and so that's kind of how it all went through my whole life. I would say, hey, this is happening over here. And she'd look at me, knock off, knock off the nonsense. You can't talk like that. That's evil. You know, that's like you, the whole, whole schmoll. And um, as a result, I was kind of raised as a little bit of an outcast that way. And I never, ever felt connected with anybody in what I call a family unit. You know, it's like... And they never ever, there never was that connection there between me and who I call Judy. And the reason I bring this up is because um, when a few years ago, I went and I actually had a DNA test done. You know, it's just one of those things you get online. It's just a little, little genealogical test that you do. Anybody can do for 39 or 40 bucks or something like that. So, oh, let's go ahead and try this out to see what it is. Because I was just curious. You know, so I sent it off and. You know, waited a couple of weeks and got my results back. And uh, that whole side of the family is English, 100%. Goes all the way back to like 1200 AD, back to a uh, time in England where London was just being formed. There was a guy there named James Foote, who was actually like the mayor of London at the time. And she traced it all the way back there uh, through the lineage of John and Priscilla Alden. And, you know, it's, very, very English, you know, 100%. Being of this religious persuasion, she actually has done a lot of genealogical work because it's big in that religion in there, you know, like, you know, you do all your genealogy so you can, you know, do all this kind of work for these people. And um, what religion is that, Don, that she... Mormon. Okay. LDS. Yeah, it's Mormon LDS. And uh, so they're really, really big. They got a big old gene genealogy lab in Salt Lake City that is just, you know, in the granite face of the mountain. It's just this huge, huge library of names that they've generated in genealogy. You go online and look at their genealogy information. And so I traced it back through that. And it's like, damn, everybody's English, you know. But on the chart that I actually got, which I've got listed on my website, it's uh, it shows that I'm like, 4% English, which is really, really on the low side. And I got the results and I said, it, I said, huh, that's interesting because I knew they're Scandinavian. My, my dad's side of the family is Scandinavian. He moved over from Denmark right before World War II. Him and my grandmother, who is Norwegian. Okay. So it's, one, it's as Scandinavian as you get to get. And it comes out 96% Scandinavian. I'm looking at it. I said, okay, you know, I set it down. Yeah, that's about right. Two weeks later, I'm looking at it again. I say, wait a minute. This is not right. Something is not kicking in here. This is not kosher. And so I took it to, a, I called up a geneticist and says, hey, you know, who is running one of the labs here in Portland? I says, hey, what's the deal with this? Why would it only come up to be like, you know, 4%, well, it wasn't even 4%, something maybe like 2% or something like that, English, if my mom was English. She says, well, that'd be showing that you're more like a, she's a, more like a second or third cousin. 
Oh, wow. I'm thinking, how does that even work? Because I know that she gave birth to me. I have the birth certificate of live birth and all that kind of stuff that they gave back in the time. And uh, so this lady gave birth to me. I saw myself being born in the delivery room. Or I saw her laying on the table in the maternity ward, you know, ready to give birth. The gray escorted me into the room. So I'm like, it doesn't seem right. So, uh, well, maybe there's a mistake. So I take it down to another lab, have another test done, and uh, the same basic results come back. And I'm looking at that again, saying, biologically, this just doesn't compute. This doesn't, you know, but it explained a lot that it happened and gone on my life. There was no connection right there. She kind of looks at me. I, I get the impression that she kind of was feeling like I wasn't hers in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she knew that there was something going on there, but she knows that she gave birth to me. So she gave birth to me. I have a responsibility to take care of this individual, but he doesn't feel like my son. That's the vibe I got as I look back on uh, as I was growing up, that there's a responsibility, which is parent, you have a responsibility anyway, right? But it was more like, um, I don't feel like he's mine type of thing going on, you know? Yeah. And there's never that connection with my siblings. They're always like, you know, who are these people I'm being raised <laughs> with? And literally in my house, I look at my son sometimes when he was growing up and I, I'd say, who are these people? I don't understand, you know? It's so strange to be raised in this house with these people because- There's such a disconnect on so many levels. Well, I'm yeah. wondering yeah. if, when you found out this, did you did you get any confirmation from your ET family that like, yes, we amassed most of the genetics from your dad's side um, in the process. We only used it itty bitty from your mom's side. Um, she was more of a vessel. Like, do you know how that that how your uh, incubation of your body was was formed or did they ever share that with you? Well, there has one. Of, I've just kind of come to the conclusion myself. I really haven't pursue that i'm not one that really asks a lot of questions i just kind of fill stuff out mm. and but you know from the information i've been getting back from them it's kind of like the egg was placed in the womb and uh, she was the carrier of the child while it was being born and so it's actually born physically through that construct but you carry the genetic material of a host that's maybe off there somewhere. Yeah. You know? okay. so it's an egg was placed in there. It could have just been a sterile egg or there's another biological, it's called Chimora, where there'll be two exact eggs and one will be sterile, one will be fertile. And then for some reason, the sterile egg takes over, but the chances of that are one in a few million or something like that. But uh, there is a chance that that actually happened. But, um, and that's why I call her Judy is because I really never have felt a connection with her. And so she's a biological unit that gave birth basically. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. So such a warm, endearing, strange. Happy, happy, happy biological unit birthday, <laughs> Judy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. And, well, you know, it's, you start thinking biologically how does that happen on a biological basis and it's like um it just kind of blew my mind there for a while it's just how does that even work you know biologically how does that happen because they were asking me the genesis was asking me well is this your real mom mm. you know because they're so heavy on my dad's side of the family that uh you was thinking, well, maybe, but I don't know how that would actually work because if she gives birth to me and I got the birth certificate and a certificate, certificate of live birth from the doctor, which is different than the birth certificate, mm -hmm. um, there's not much chance that anything like that would happen. She, I think she was getting an adoption or something like that at a really young age, but no. Nah. And also nah. you remember it. I mean, you were there being walked into the body. Your spirit was being walked into the body at the time of uh, before being yeah, born so yeah. there's many was, things confirming i was sitting up there kind of in the corner of the room with the gray and we were looking down and he was communicating with me you'd call it talking but it was just communication mind-to-mind -mind communication type of thing and he's he was saying well don't forget 
and he went over it really briefly of how consciousness works, how DNA works. And he says, this is what's going to happen to you when you're born type of thing. And uh, we'll always be around. And it's pretty much been the case. So, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> Have you been able to um, recall who you were but prior to birth in terms of do you have any memories, pre-birth memories? That is the only one I have so far. I mean, I really haven't, I could delve into it a little bit, but there's kind of been blocks that are placed here and there. Got a mm -hmm. lot of consciousness memories of stuff that's happened out of my body since I've been born, but I haven't got anything going back to pre-birth. I mean, if you're talking um, previous lives, there, sure. I, do, I do have a little bit of memory of previous lives before here. Uh, but I haven't been on this planet too many times. So most people be reincarnated, reincarnated, reincarnated. And that has to do with the DNA and what I call DNA shadowing. When the spirit, the unconscious self and the conscious self kind of get together and they shadow each other. And uh, I guess be more, a term the more people be associated with be assimilation, okay? Where the physical... The unconscious self and the conscious self merge and uh, the DNA kind of lines up and then the conscious self imprints on the unconscious self, which is where you carry all your memories is with the DNA from the unconscious self. That's how it gets around. Otherwise, you just have a conscious self, which is your ego, which is a physical body that looks out and sees everything. It would never remember anything that goes on. It would never remember any past lives or anything of that nature or any anything to do with heaven or any, because you're just in a locked system and you live, you yeah. die. And I, then all you would ever remember is a genealogical line of all the people that you have a bloodline with. Okay. So it's a spirit self that carries everything through the DNA, the unconscious self. We develop that, that uh, subconscious self as a filter between the two of them. So it keeps one wow. system from being overloaded with the other system. And you know, so like uh, the whole thing, I think I'm not big on quoting religious leaders, but I think Jesus put it as uh, you want to overcome the physical self. And to do that, you're removing the subconscious self and allowing the, the unconscious self to kind of take over. You know? But to do that, it's kind of overloading the DNA and the brain cells and everything. And a lot of people can't handle that. So that subconscious self acts as a filter. And so they over, override the subconscious self. You got to get rid of all your fears and, uh, you know. Yeah, able, that sounds kind of like the whole process of being able of like the, the egoic self is surrendered. Like there's, there's the higher self and there's the egoic self. And the egoic self has to surrender under that higher self. And the, that filter of the subconscious now becomes a more clear filter. So things are able to go through versus there being barriers um, yeah, exactly. of the egoic mind. Exactly. Yeah, that's but fascinating. But if the if you're living life with the ego and you never really become aware of the unconscious self and you don't let it do its thing, then that unconscious self carries all that weight with it through the, with the DNA into the next life. And so that's where the reincarnation of karma keeps coming in. Wow. That makes sense. It keeps the, so the DNA actually gets imprinted with uh, the info. Yeah. I wanted to see if uh, Mr. Jason or Miss Linda had any thoughts at this juncture. I do have a question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and this is in regards to, so growing up, there's this feeling that the house is haunted. However, it stated in the bio that we realize now it wasn't due to spirit haunting. It was because of these abduction or ET type of experiences tying back into when we see this craft covered shape at the gas station, you're like, that's where the ghosts live. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what type of experiences were they? Because there could be other people watching that think that they're dealing with a spirit haunting when uh, it's actually not a spirit haunting. It's, it's a contact experience. The, um, we lived in a little tiny rural farmhouse once we moved up to Utah. I mean, a, a real tiny farming community. Okay. And uh, the house that we live in that I first could, you know, came to believe was haunted. I would wake up with night terrors and there'd be people shining flashlights through the window, what I believe was flashlights through the window. 
and they would call the police over and they'd do an investigation, never find anybody. Uh, the ghosts would be coming through the wall and tickling me and giving me a bad time at night, which was actually, if you've seen Whitley Strieber's communion, <clears throat> it was when Christopher Walken is dancing with the little troll guy. Um, I don't know if you've seen that or not, but there's a little troll guy, maybe about three feet tall. He's just this gray looking being, I mean, not gray, but black looking being who's got this big smile on his face. They would come in and get me all the time. And I thought they were the ghosts walking through the wall. Uh, there'd be times I was scared to death to go down in the basement. You know, you could not pay me to go down the basement because that's where the ghosts live. And in reality, what was happening was that's where a portal existed where you would walk in and out of the portal. And looking back on it, what they were doing is telling me, don't go in the basement. The ghosts live there because if you get lost in that portal, we may not find you again. So we don't want you going downstairs. But I was always scared to death. I would say, uh, Judy would look at me. She would say, hey, go down and grab the clothes out of the dryer, you know, because she... After a while, she just got tired of hanging clothes up on the line because during that summer, and I found this out, you know, 20 years later, uh, 30 years later, actually, and she would go out and she would hang her clothes up on the line, which they did a lot back then. Okay, that's how they dried their clothes off. In the summer, they would just go out and throw them on the line. They'd all be neatly folded on the back porch, you know, so she just got scared to death to go out there and you know, put the clothes on the line so she bought a dryer, yeah, and um, she'd say, hey, go down and get the clothes out of the dryer. I said, no, I'm not going downstairs. She said, you know, young man, you go down and you get the clothes out of the dryer. I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going down there. In fact, it got to the point where once I was sliding across the linoleum floor on my socks, I slipped and lost my balance, and I fell and tumbled down the stairs and smacked my head on the back of the plaster, and it was just bleeding all over the place. Head wounds really were really bad, and I I forgot all about that. I was bleeding and I just looked out there and said, ghost. I turned around and ran back upstairs and I started screaming and crying because, you know, blood was pouring all over the place. My head hurt, you know, so it was, it was those kind of things. Since we went, moved from there to another little house <clears throat> in Southern Utah, even a tinier town. I mean, this was like maybe hundred people lived there at the most, right? And, um, Judy, we came, we, my stepdad had a habit of just taking off at night and driving around looking for jackrabbits out in the desert. So he would load me and my brother into the truck and we'd go out and we'd go cruising around. Well, we came back one night and she was locked up in the car. She said, I'm not going back in that house. She says, it's haunted. There's something staring at me and I, I can't go back into the house. Um, so we'd walk in, there was nothing there. You know, I mean, it was just the lights were on and this is where in the sink and there's nothing there. And uh, so we went out a, next week and we're out there driving around and we come back and all the lights in the house were on, the doors were locked, the windows were shut. Uh, the radio was hanging off the table and it was, but it was full blast. It was going full blast. And um, people were just scared to stay in that house. And so we were thinking it was haunted, but I don't think it was haunted. I think it was just an ET type of thing that that happened that was going on because they seemed to follow me around when I was a kid. So, and they did the same thing when we moved again to another little town up in uh, central Utah. So, yeah, it's. The I big love that. House in Spanish. In, in, I'm sorry. Say it, we say that again. The big, the big one was in that house we we're living at, but you know, when we first moved to Utah, but it followed us into another house where you'd hear footsteps ringing up and down the stairs all the time. And uh, just uh, these odd little occurrences would happen and uh, you know, doors would open and shut and nobody was there. So, yeah. I just love the fact that your mom was like, or Judy was like, I'm getting a dryer. Like, I'm just, it's not happening. I'm not going to deal with it. I will buy a dryer. Um, hop in, Miss Linda. Um, all of us women that did laundry were like, Hell yeah, let's yeah. have 
that's a friendly ghost there, huh? I was like, <laughs> that was really Don't kind of it. surprised me too, because I never knew about that till oh, uh, like 26 years later. I mean, I was like 40 years old when the last chat conversation I had with her was like, uh, tell me about this little house over in this part of the country, you know? And she would say, what do you want to know? I said, well, can you tell me anything about the hauntings or anything like that? She goes, I want to talk about it. I'm like, well, anything? I'd just like to know what happened there. She says, I don't know, but the full the clothes were always folded up nightly, nice and neat on the back porch in the morning, and it freaked me out. And that's all I'm saying. So, yeah. I'd be saying thank you. And <laughs> up, leave a little goodies for them. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, but her being, in, in fairness, her being a single parent at the time with two kids, she was raising up in a rural community, freaked her out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Of course. It's like, just religious. So like, this is not yeah. in the continuum of right. reality of how reality works. Yeah. Yeah. So did, I have a question though. Um, yeah. Growing up in that, did you ever, what kind of physical sensations did you have when you were feeling it, um, feeling disease around that? Um, um, like when you were not going downstairs, was there anything physical that you felt in that room? Deep terror is basically about it. It was like, uh, it was just terrified, you know, like going downstairs in the basement was like, a, it was just terrifying, you know, it's like, yeah, no, uh, it's, there's something down there waiting for you, like you got to come around in the corner, and come down the stairs and look around the corner and someone's going to snatch you type of thing. Yeah, it, it was like, I did not go down there, you know, at all, as even as a child, I was about five years old at the time, and it was like it was not happening, which five years old is that mystery age where a lot of stuff starts happening, yeah, and it was no different in my case, that's where it all really started happening, that age in 24, when I turned 24, that's when it really hit too, I mean, there were some experiences that happened at 24 that was like, Wow, really? Or 14? Well, I guess my whole life. Never mind. Yeah. Was there a time where you kind of denied the things that were going on just to kind of fit in? Or did you oh, always just accept yeah. it? See, when I turned 24, um, you know, I had all these experiences happen up to that point in my life. And I was kind of what at 24, I was kind of born again. Yeah, and I was like gung ho. It's like, yes, this is it, man. I found it. Yeah, this is my place. Yada yada yada. Um, I was really, I was like a teacher and uh, president in some functions of our organization in the church at the time. And I'm like, yeah, I'm really gonna go for this. And this event happens, and I have like a past life memory of all these encounters I'd had up to that point, and. Uh, it's a little farming community in a rural, very conservative area of the country. And I'm looking around and I'm thinking, well, who is, the, you know, where, what you gonna do about this? And so the internet had just come out. That's how old I am, yeah, yeah. The internet had just come out and I was able to find out the Center for UFO Studies with Alan Heineck back in, I think it was Illinois at the time, Chicago, I believe. And uh, I got a hold of him and I explained to him what was going on. The whole time I'm doing this, I'm sitting in the very corner of the basement of the house. This is a two story house. I'm sitting in the very corner of the basement of the house. Nobody's home. And I'm on the phone holding it in the corner and I'm going, I've had an experience. And he says, What? You know, he would say, You got to speak up. I can't hear you. You know, I'm like, yeah, and I explained to him what had happened. He says, okay, well, here's what you do. You write it down on paper and send it to this address right here, and we will get back with you. You know, I figured, oh, God, I finally found somebody I could talk to about this, right? It, it was after like a month of searching to try to figure out what, what was going on. Because I had never even heard of anything like this before, right? I mean, well, I can't say as I haven't heard. I mean... I went to the library and there was like two books on the subject back in 70s, you know, and um, I'm looking around and I can't find any information. I can't find anybody to talk to, of course, in the area, but I figure if I go to like a, my pastor, bishop, whatever you want to call him, you know, my ecclesiastical leader, you know, like, yeah, right. You know, you've obviously been visited by the devil. We're going to give you some medication and send you to counseling and, 
yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, I can't, no, because this happened. This is real. It, it really happened. I know it did. I've got some physical evidence to say that it did, and you're going to lock me up type of thing. It says, no. So I found Alan Hynek, and I sent him off all this information, and he, nobody ever got back with me. It was like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks goes by. I try to call back. I can't get a hold of anybody. And I just kind of says, thanks, chat. You know, like, what do I do now? You know? So I just buried it for like about 13 years. I said, oh, yeah. I don't know what to do with this, you know? So I just went around the community, felt a little bit like James Bond or something, some sort of a secret agent. So, and I would just go to the mall and I would just study people and I would just say, do they know? Does he know? Does he know? You know, I was literally having this PTSD moment for 13 years. And it's like, there's nowhere to go, nothing to do. So I buried it until one day I just said, you know what? I got to figure out what's going on. I have to figure out what's going on. So I just went like a bull in a china closet. And um, I started, I figured I have to go inside because nobody's telling me, if I can't find any information on this. I don't know where to go. There's no organizations that I'm aware of in my area. I've got to be able to go inside to find the answers because there's nothing out there that's telling me what's happening. So I asked to go down the rabbit hole and boy, was there a big hole. So, what kind of physical uh, evidence did you uh, have? Well, when I woke up, I, um, I, of course, I just blew everything off and I went to the library to see if there's any kind of books at all I could find on the subject. Yeah, and uh, as I'm driving back, I still got this heavy connection going on. This is back in when I was 24 and 84. And uh, I hear this voice, it's saying, your son's gonna tell you about an experience he has and the marks are our marks. You know? So I drive back and he meets me at the doorway. We sit down on the porch and he says, dad, I had this really weird experience last night. And he tells me about him being chased around the house by bears and the bears capture him and they take him on into their cave type of thing. I'm thinking, oh my God. And he's, then he's got a scoop mark on the back of his leg that's bleeding. And uh, I'm looking at that scoop mark and I'm just, my hands just trembling and I just like, and I get a band aid and put back on it. I'm like, God, he says, I don't know how I got this. They says, I must have caught it when I was climbing under a fence, Dad, because I'm, I'm looking at it, it's just a round scoop mark, right? And um, it just, I'm just floored. It's just like, what the hell? You know? And so the evidence was a scoop mark back there for one. And uh, that just kind of sold me on the doll right then and there. It's like, okay, all this stuff is real. You know, and it's well, what do you do with it at that point? You know, nothing. I just held on to it for years. You can't, you can't do anything with it in that type of community I was being raised in. You know, and then one day, 14 years later, 13 years later, I get this voice that says, Hey, Don, it's time. It's like, I just dropped everything I'm doing and went off on the shamanic hunt trying to figure out what's going on. So, well, let's talk about that. But you had an experience of you and your son being on the ship. Yeah. Was this is this before your shamanic ex- journey? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a question from Brianna that we'll get to here as well. But go ahead and tell us about your experience with you and the son on the ship. Okay. What had happened was uh, I was having this not a crisis, but I was this extreme interest in paranormal going on at the time, you know, and ghosts and. I was watching these shows on TV, like In Search of with Leonard Nimoy. He had this little series out. They did something on the Bermuda Triangle. I remember watching that specifically and then shutting off the VCR that I had it recorded on. And remember, I had to go to school early in the morning. And I didn't want to, you know, it was already like 1130 or 12 o'clock at night. I thought, okay, you know, I just shut off. My son was laying on the bed. I had a mattress on the floor for my son on the side of me and I was sleeping on a fold out bed at the time in my mom's basement and while I was going to school. And uh, all of a sudden I'm waking up in the middle of the night and I'm hearing my son playing with his little toy truck off the side of the bed. 
And I look over there and there's this truck that has like an inch of, I was terrible at dusting, you know, and there's like a literally an inch of dust or something sitting on this old toy truck that he never played with anymore. Right. Cause they get the truck, they play with the package and then they throw the truck away. It's like that type of thing. So yeah, this little Jeep is pushing back and forth by the side of the bed. I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know, it's like three in the morning or something. Right. And then I see something hanging in the corner of the room and it's this gray and it's this gray that's been with me for, I don't know, before I was born, he's the one that escorted me into the delivery room. And he's floating in the corner of the room and he points at my son. And, and I, at that moment, it's like, oh, you've got something to do with you. You want something to do with him. Okay, but I'm going to go with you because that way he's not going to get all freaked out if he knows that I'm hanging around, right? So he takes both me and my son and we exit this is where because we go right through the cement wall which is a you know it was in the basement so we go right through the cement wall right through the ground and then when we come out the other side there is a we're in a blue light it's a blue beam that's hooking up to the ship that's across the street it's hanging like maybe 40 or 50 feet up in the air it's maybe about 30 or 40 feet wide you know just this big old ship around the sh top of the ship you see the red and the blue lights they're strobing and there's a house sitting right off to the left hand side and on the top you remember looking over the house and on the roof of the house you could see the light strobing off of it <clears throat> and the thing that was really really strange about the whole thing was how quiet it was it was like you could hear a pin drop from a mile away type of quiet that's how quiet it was it was like going into vacuum. In fact, I think that's kind of what we were doing was going into a vacuum. It's an interdimensional thing with these beings as much as it is a physical thing. And so they were taking our bodies interdimensionally through this being into the ship. And there were no dogs barking. There's no wind blowing. And the wind always blows there at night a little bit. You didn't hear any crickets. There's nothing. It was just deadly silence. And so this being was going through light ahead of me. And I had my son right next to the side of me and I'm looking and we're about ready to go through the electrical lines that are across the street, the power lines. And I'm thinking, oh my God, we're gonna go right through these lines, man. I, you know, And we just keep going. And as we go through these lines, you, you could feel the tingle going through your body. It was like a, just a little tingle, tingling sensation from electricity. <clears throat> but it didn't impact you know, our speed or anything at all. We just went right through them, you know? And we get on this ship and I'm walking around the uh, outside and then it's just me and this Nordic lady, okay? And it felt like I was good friends with her. I'd known her for a really long time because we were walking around the outside of the ship and we were just talking, like communicating mind to mind. It wasn't like we were talking, I was just communicating mind to mind. And there's this kind of a sponge mat that we were walking on as we're walking around the ship and it was very alien 100 percent everything was like shiny metal um like polished silver type of thing yeah and as we're walking around the ship i had this serious problem with my stomach that was going on and it had been ongoing for a while and i looked at her and i says can you heal me of this and she just laughs at me i could hear her laughing echo in my head i look over at her and i said no i'm serious and she touched my arm, my shoulder, looked me in the eyes and says, it will be okay. Yeah, I'm like, oh, of course, <laughs> duh. Yeah, I don't know why I did that, but it was like, it just totally, it was like gone. Yeah, that notion that I need to do anything about it, which it has, it's been okay, it disappeared. You know, it's not there anymore. And so we're walking around this side of the ship still, I don't know where we were going, but we stop and there's an archway off the left-hand side and we stop at this archway and you could see into this room and there's this vertical beam going up through the room and on it is like a shower massage thing, okay? It's connected to beam, not necessarily sure what it's for. It may be like uh, something to cleanse the body, you know? So, and around it, there's a, like a catwalk. <clears throat> And my son is sitting there with a friend that 
it, it's a friend that he found a little bit later. You know, they just moved into town. So he was there with his friend, and they were sitting up, standing on this count walk next to this vertical beam, and they would take the shower massage off and hold it over their heads. And when they hold over their heads, you get this blue bolt of electricity that would just stream over their body. And they would just crack up laughing. <clears throat> it was just like it was tickling him or something. And then the other guy, would, his little buddy that he met, would, who had the black hair, kind of a chubby looking kid, about the same height, same age, uh, he would hold it over his head. It would same thing would happen. It'd go down over his body, and you'd hear they would just crack up laughing. Yeah. So, whatever it was was tickling him, but I think it was more for cleaning. Mm -hmm. You know, the germs and stuff off your body. I mm -hmm. guess would be the best way to describe it. And her general intent, I think, was just to let him know that I was nearby, although he wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. So we continue walking, and uh, they show me this lady. Who I met later on, but her face was blocked, blacked out. I couldn't see her face. And she says, This this individual, this lady will change your life. I said, okay. And we what, just, what what lady will change your life? The Nordic lady? No, the lady that she showed me. Was on the it, ship. That was also on the ship. Oh, okay, okay. I'm yeah. there. Yeah, right. This lady will change your life. Which I did meet later on down the road. It was pretty much hung up. Yeah, she did. She helped out tremendously and yeah. probably when I needed it. And um, which I had to go halfway around the world to find her. But, you know, it was like, OK. So that led, led to another whole obsession for a while. But uh, we get around to that point, And then the scene skips. And I'm off the ship. I'm by myself with my gray being who's like I said, has been with me forever, who came and got me. And we're sitting in a garage someplace that somebody had just moved into. And you can see the boxes stacked along the wall. I'm standing on one end next to the door in the back of the garage. And on the other end is the garage doors were closed. And you can see this black shadow figure just kind of moving across, kind of like carnival, like something you'd see at the carnival, it moved to one side of the wall and bounce, turn around and bounce and come back to the other side. And it would just keep going back and forth. And the shadow figure was there and he pointed at me and it was like a bullhorn ringing in my head. He was saying, it is forbidden to walk through those. Walk through and those what? The shadow being that was there. So what he was saying but was, you don't want to share space with that shadow being. Oh, boom. Okay, that was his way of being able to communicate to me. He says, it's forbidden to walk through those. So he says, don't share space with that shadow being. Um, it's not good. Okay, it's don't do that. And then next thing I know, we are in the living room of the house upstairs from my bedroom. There's a big old plate glass window that's maybe about an eight by 10 window that, you know, is... You look out there and you can see the mountains out there in the days. It was just a beautiful view. And um, the door was open and there was just a screen door looking outside. And I could look through the screen door and I could see the ship outside the house. <clears throat> and this red and blue light was blinking, strobing through the room. And uh, you could hear it humming. It was just like, hum, 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 hum. And it was humming it was like a sci-fi thriller or something like that. But uh, I hear this commotion. I'm looking at a love seat that's sitting right next to, that I'm standing right next to. And my son and his little friend are on this love seat and they're squabbling, you know, just doing their kid thing. They're just kind of playing with each other, squabbling and picking at each other, that kind of thing. And in the rest of the room, oh, I can remember over by the fireplace, which is on the other side of the room. It was maybe the room was like a, you know, 20 by. 15 or something like that. I had a couch and everything. And then on the other side was a fireplace. And next to the fireplace, there's an older couple standing. Everybody was naked and they were standing, staring at each other, you know, like they were comatose. They were just like facing each other, but they were naked. And they were standing in front of them. There was an older couple that I recognized lived in the community, were one of the prominent people in the community, you know, and they were standing there, staring. And there was like maybe, 10 other people just standing aimlessly in the living room. And I'm looking around at them 
and the thing that really struck out at me was the strobing lights that were bouncing off their faces and their comatose look they had on their face because none of them were really conscious of what was going on or where they were at. They were just standing in the living room staring at each other, you know, in no particular fashion except for this older couple across the other side. Yeah, and that's, and the next thing I remember, I popped off my bed. I'm like, what the hell? You know, all these memories of these other incidents that had happened up in my life, things that I thought were strange that I was sharing with people that were laughing at me about. It's like being stuck up in the canyon and cornered by wild animals type of thing. <clears throat> Everything made sense. And these, I, these things were popping into my head. It's like, wow, that happened that night and that happened that night. And it's like, wow, back when I was four in this house and, you know, this is what was happening. It wasn't haunted. And this house over here wasn't haunted. It was like, wow. And then it, all the way back to before I was born, I'm remembering all this stuff just floods into my head at once. And I'm just totally like blown away because this stuff shouldn't happen. You know, I'm like, you know, in my mind at the time, I'm like, one of God's chosen, you know, we're like, whoa, this is like, the earth is the center of the universe, you know, and Jesus <laughs> and all this stuff like this, this, nothing existed out there. So what's this? Wow. And it was like them knocking on the door saying, hey, here we are. Now what you going to do? Yeah, we're going to crack open this flimsy, flimsy facade that you have been given yeah. And that's who you are and what your identity is and what you believe. And we're just going to crap all over that. And, and, uh, and, and it, the PTSD was really, really bad for a long time. Oh, my God. I, I would go into this uh, religious environment every Sunday and I would teach like a lesson or something like that. Right. And uh, I'm looking at just delving into these really deep concepts and looking at these people in the audience are looking at me going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't talking about UFOs. It was just talking about stuff. Like the that, nature of life. The nature of life. Yeah. 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 And uh, I did just, you just never are able to put the pieces together at all. You know, it's like, okay, where does this all fit in? Because it didn't, mm -hmm. still doesn't in some aspects. So. Well, I mean, I think that's part of the integration of the star beings with, with us in you know in, in our in our overall consciousness Linda did you have a question do you want to hop in yeah I mean we have a couple that we definitely want to get to but I had a yes. quick question of why do you, you know they obviously knew what they were the environment they were putting you in why do you think that they put you in a family that was in that type of a environment you know I asked the praying mantis that one time and because uh, I had that full-fledged praying mantis experience up in the mountains of northeastern Utah. And uh, that was one of the questions that came out. I says, well, why am I in this family? Why did you put me here? And it was more or less like we're hiding you. And oh, I wow. think what they meant to say was your energy matches up to this kind of environment right now. And so this is our way of just kind of keeping you under cover. And it made sense at the time because there have been, and I'm not exaggerating this at all, there have been physical attacks on me for, um, you know, coming out and talking about it. Because they told me once upon a time, don't talk about this. So I said, all right, now let's write a book. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, you've had some distinct men in black experiences. So I'm trying yeah, to keep a yeah. running track of this because I want to talk about your shamanic journey and then your men in black experiences, the mantis. How can we, if we can cover all this all, but we also want to get to a couple of questions here. Um, Leisha asks, Leisha, we're so happy you're here. All the this, uh, live streamers, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm curious to know what the purpose of Don's ET family is to have his soul here on the planet at this time. So if they've given you like what your purpose is, why your ET soul is here in the world. We're like anchors is the best way to put it is because uh, it's like, um, this is a closed containment type of environment that Earth, planet Earth is, okay? So like I was saying before, you have the ego, which is a conscious self. If it was just stripped of the physical body, we'd be walking around in a closed environment 
and there would be nothing really there. I mean, you would just be life and death and the genealogical lines would be all you had. Uh, introducing the unconscious self to the physical self, the conscious self, what that does is it introduces the spirit and your ability to connect with the other lives that, you, that the spirit lives. Okay, so the, that thing which gives us life, um, you'd be able to contact that and it gives you the ability to connect with the other side, so to speak, your, <clears throat> excuse me, your true, ge well, tongue -tied, yeah. your true genealogical line is actually your spirit line, okay, your unconscious self, okay? Most people aren't aware of that, and so they introduce beings into this planet that can kind of pierce that and just kind of anchor the planet and give people some knowledge and some idea of what else is going on out there. You know, otherwise, you're just kind of walking around in ignorance, and so... It's their purpose to be able to open things up and to lighten the mood, so to speak. Yep. Mm, yeah, to lighten the density and the frequency. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. And then uh, Brianna has a question. She says, does Don have any awareness through dream or meditation or direct knowledge of another version of himself in stasis? Yes, like on a ship. Like, is there an ET part of you that's like hanging out on a ship in stasis while the consciousness is being you know, experience in your body? I believe so. Yeah. Cause uh, there have been times where people walked up to me and they say, Hey, I had an experience and you were on the ship with me. You know what I mean? It was like, so what I'm thinking is actually happening is there are other selves like us out there. And I would like to refer to them as a kind of a clone type of beings that they come in and they take the gene, the DNA and the gene a lot. I mean, the DNA and the, uh, the cellular information and they'll put it on another ship and you will have and they'll grow that clone up in this other environment then you have a connection with that other clone as well because it's made out of your dna uh i think clive barker i think is what it is or clive something or another uh did experiments with plants where he would take these plants and he would grow them up together and then he'd separate them in different rooms and he hurt one plant the other plant would be able to feel it he would do experiences where other plants would be able to feel it and so there's that connection interdimensionally between us to where you can actually know where somebody is by accessing the other individual. You know, there's that cellular memory that says, oh, yeah, that guy's over here. He's in this other dimension. He's on this other planet. You know, so, yeah, there is that thing going on. I think all of us have it. And they, they so when they do a DNA specimen, it's, they're actually taking a piece of you, which has your cellular memories, and they know where you're at and what you're doing, and they can make contact with you. They just keep that thing alive on the ship and wow. order more cellular implants on it if they need to. It's such a <laughs> wild, wild world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, it's like our vision is like 10% of what's actually happening. Um, so Nancy's also got a question. Nancy legit asks, um, by what you said earlier, um, is the inference that the Scandinavian humans are directly related to the Nordic ET beings? Is there a connection between the Nordics and the Scandinavians? Yeah, that definitely. I think there's a strong connection, just like there is with the Celtics uh, and the Native Americans. I think the Native Americans as well are direct lineage from uh, ETs. You know, and that's why it, they have a harder time dealing with certain functions and certain things that the white man has introduced. Basically, the European Caucasian man has introduced into their system. They have a harder time dealing with that because their DNA and their lineage is different. And so they react differently to things uh, based upon that DNA lineage. I think that's probably the case where a, with different cultures around the world for that matter my feeling is that um these different cultures were placed here originally by different beings you have your european culture you have your african-american culture you have your europe and then your asian cultures uh and indian cultures all that stuff you look at originally they were just around the planet at yeah. certain areas and they will say well they came originally from africa you know and, 
genealogically in the DNA kind of goes back to that. But I think a lot of them were just placed there by these interdimensional, I mean, interplanetary species to see how they would react. So we're kind of an experiment. <clears throat> for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think we're a, we are a multi-layered genetic experiment by many different yeah. uh, ET star beings as far as I can see. Um, yeah, like, wow, it's just fascinating. The more you unravel it, the more there is to unravel. Um, so I, if you would bring us, we'll kind of get back onto our groove here in terms of your um, experiences through your life. And you had said that at a certain point you, you were like, okay, you were told it's time now. And you're like, okay, great. Finally, it's time. And you started the, really this sort of shamanic questing. Would you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. It was... Um... I was really heavy into uh, like being a soccer coach and youth coach and that kind of stuff in the community. And um, I was having these teams that were very, very successful in the upper levels of uh, being able to compete. And we're ready to start a new season up. And uh, I was sitting out of the backyard, just admiring the sunset. And all of a sudden this voice, like it's like, I'm talking to you speaks to me and says, Hey Don, it's time. I'm like, Oh, okay. Oh, let's just start this thing, whatever it is. I didn't know what it was. It says, how is this going to affect my relationship with uh, my son? You know, because he's my true family. The other ones I really didn't care about too much. Right? It says, oh, it's only going to increase and help you function normally type of thing. So I said, okay, okay, let's do it. So at that point, it turned into this shamanic, like, I've got to figure out what's going on. You know, and um, I started having... Well, it kind of starts when I start astral projecting because I figure, well, I'm going to astral project and I'm going to see if I can make contact with these beings. So I'm trying to astral project. I'm trying hard to astral project and it's not working. I'm getting the frequency going on and all that kind of stuff. But I just keep getting slammed back in the body. And that's not because of fear, but I'm getting slammed back. And at the same time, I'm going through these... Um, meditations that well i'll put it this way these meditations i was going through is the exact same thing that robert monroe was doing at his institution okay but i was being guided there through some other process yes and i recognize this because a couple of years ago a few years ago i went to robert monroe's institute to do some astral projection studies to try to figure out what it was that i was doing you know because it wasn't astral projection, but it wasn't remote viewing. And I didn't know what I was doing, you know, but I was, it was more like a theta type of thing where I'd leave my body, I'd go through my body, I'd go up in the sky and I would, you know, find my location and uh, then take off and travel, which got really interesting at particular points in time. So I'm going there and I buy and borrow Monroe's tapes. So I go through the study and realize that I'm not doing what they're doing, but I'm doing something different. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I got to one point where the instructor looked at me. He, he took me through this. He took everybody through a nine step process to get through your astral projection and to astral project. And my nine step process was actually us traveling through a ship, uh, the first three, four steps, right? And I was explaining this to him. He looked at me and said, So you're a Star Wars fan? I go, No, I like the shows, but you know, I don't have any memorial memorabilia or anything hanging around he says why do you keep bringing up the star wars type stuff so, he says, you know <laughs> i wonder yeah and then i brought his tapes and it was the same exact thing that he was walking me through was what i've already learned and already knew but nobody was teaching me yet so i was picking it up from somewhere right so i um I was starting this stuff off. I was doing the house projection, like I was saying, and it wasn't going anywhere. So I started doing my deep meditations and it was taking me through Robert Monroe's technique. And um, I wake up one morning and it, it brought to the point where I was getting, I felt like I was getting someplace. And uh, one morning I'm about ready to wake up. You could hear the wind blowing through the window up up above my head and I knew it was getting early morning because the wind, you know, the breeze would always pick up and you hear the 
the curtain shutter and I didn't have any uh, screen on my window and it was, you know, it was ground level almost. So anything could come through there and it did a couple of times, dog, you know, <laughs> in the window. And um, I was in that mood where you're like half awake and half asleep. You know how it is where you think, oh, I need to get up. I got a day to do, yada, yada, hit the alarm clock, go back to sleep type of thing. And I'm sitting there and I hear this cat purring off to the side of my bed. I'm thinking to myself, damn cat got in the house. Oh man, I got to get out, get that cat out of the house, you know? And uh, then I hear a little bit of a meow, you know, like a soft meow. I was like, meow. And how'd the cat get in the house? Right? And I'm debating on whether I'm going to get up right then or just let the cat just sit there for a while. But then I'm thinking, hey, I don't have a cat. I mean, we live on a farmish community and we have dogs and, you know, all kinds of farm animals and garden and the whole shot. And I'm thinking, I don't have a cat. Where'd this cat come from? You know, and then I hear it meow again. I'm thinking, how is it even, you know, because it was, it was like bed level, but there's nothing there. Okay, there was no shelf or anything next to my bed. It was like, I'm getting this vision. It's just hanging in the air. I'm like, what the hell? So I open my eyes, and the minute I open my eyes, my body freezes. I, I, I can't move. I'm looking straight ahead, and I can move my eyes back and forth, but I can't move my head. I can't move my body at all. It's just frozen. And I see this hand, the left hand, floating in the air, you know, from about the elbow up. I, I see this hand floating in the air. And it's a gray hand. It's, you know, it's got three fingers and a thumb. And it's holding this oval rod, which is maybe about this long, about three inches long. And it's oval shaped. And it's a neon blue. And it's glowing. And he's holding it in his hands. I'm looking at it. What the hell? It's not something you see every day, right? And he reaches up to my forehead and he takes his, there's another hand that shows up and he smacks my head, smacks that little end of the little rod into my head. I can feel my head bouncing in my pillow. And uh, he does that like nine times. Every time he does it, my head's bouncing in my pillow. And I can feel this thing just kind of sinking into my forehead and my third eye. And it gets to the point where it's about halfway in my head and this hand's moving and you feel it just go, just sucks into my head. And the minute it does that, his hands disappear and I flip out out of my bed and go, what the, you know? And this voice pops in and says, this is advice to help activate your third eye. And it'll also help you record 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 your experiences or somebody's recording something somewhere i don't know what it is. <laughs> it's gonna be yeah. recording through recording. your experience oh. it's being recorded yeah yeah so i'll be there so it's going to really pop open my third eye and it's going to help others to be able to see i guess through that device i don't know what it wow, is Seth. yeah and um he says, we will come back and we will show you how to activate the device. And that's a we. We will show you how to activate the device. You know, so me being like I am, I'm just like, okay, that's <laughs> kind of weird. You know, it's like, a, and walking through this day and my whole head is just kind of feeling disoriented. I mean, I'm feeling disoriented a little bit for the first couple of hours walking around and then it just kind of goes away a little bit. You get the weird feeling that something's there. And it's like, well, what the hell do I do with this? You know, I mean, do why did they put that there? Did I ask for this? Are they, you know, why, why this? And I guess I kind of have been at, had been asking for it by investigating and going on these different little meditations and all this kind of stuff. And, um, <clears throat> So I go through my day, come home, I'm exhausted. I jump in bed and like maybe about three in the morning, I'm popping up straight out of bed as this voice is echoing in my head says, Don, well now I'll show you how to activate the device. I said, okay. So it says, sit up straight in bed, hold your back straight 
draw the energy all the way up through your spine, all the way up into your head, into your forehead, and let it shoot out your forehead, yeah, which now I know is a Kundalini energy they were working with, right? So, so I did that. I'm really vision coming out, and my head just explodes when I push it out through my head. My head explodes. I feel like just, I don't know, it, it is just the weirdest feeling I've ever felt. It felt like every little hair on my head was needles. Okay, I mean, if I run my head, my hands through here, it just felt like I was needles. It was really bad for, and it lasted that way for about a month before it finally went away. You know, before it finally, because I'd go to bed and I'd lay my head down on my pillow and it was just like, you know, got, there's no way you get away from it for a while. You know, I mean, it didn't really hurt, but it was just really annoying. And then on my forehead, I developed this rash and that sat there for like about a week and a half, two weeks. And I'd be walking around. And I had this rash. It was, my head was peeling and it was really red right there. And people were looking at me saying, Hey, what's wrong with your forehead? I'm like, uh, uh, sunburn. <laughs> you want me to tell you what, you know, I don't. <laughs> I could tell you, but you're going to laugh at me, you know, so. And ever since Alien then, device, eye, thanks. Yeah, ever since then, that third eye has just been wide open, okay, which has allowed me to be able to, you know, for one of you, the demon world has really been exposed. I've really been able to see these demon attachments that are attached to people, that type of thing, mm -hmm. um, and to be able to skedaddle them and once they see you and they recognize you're there they're like okay we're out here and they're gone pretty much except the hardcore ones um spirit world uh, being able to travel has been out of my body the out of conscious thing and what i'm what i've come to the conclusion is that when i do this what they call this consciousness sharing which is a combination of the astral projection and uh you know remote viewing type of thing it allowed that to happen a lot easier. And I think it's probably because the Kundalini energy was released. And so they would shoot me off to other planets or, you know, be able to see these other realities really, really well. And the heaven realm, which is out there, it's real, it's a real place. To, it's a physical interdimensional place. Yeah. So. Well, it's, I mean, all of this, all of these things are like huge conversations to delve into, honestly. I mean, yeah. gosh, we could do a whole show on any one of those topics. Um, the thought that comes to my mind is that like with, with for all the suffering that you have been through, at least there's like now some reward where you are connected into so many realms. I know there's also a responsibility with that as well, but as well, but at least you have like this myriad of connection that you can tap into anytime. I wanted to make sure Jason and Linda got in with any questions or thoughts before we move forward. I'm just, well, I kind of have two questions. One about the, the, the blue device thing. Obviously your body's physically reacting, right? Like you can feel yeah. your head bouncing. Yeah. Like was there yeah. pain or any other sensation other than like, pressure? was it like being at the dentist and you're numb and you can feel like the pushing and the pulling, but you can't feel anything else. It was kind of a numbing, cool sensation. Not when they do this stuff, which, they've done a couple of other things before it's like a cool blue electrical energy is the best way to describe it it's you can feel it and it's cool there's a cool sensation that's involved with it and there's kind of a tingling like a menthol yeah kind of like a menthol type of thing but it sinks deep into your head and you feel it there for a while and then as it adjusts it kind of fades out yeah and then my second question, I feel like I'm echoing. Um, has the has the gray being that you've been with or has been with you, has he told you a name? You know, no, I've never really asked him. I do have a name of another guide who is more prominent when it shows up. He's a human looking guy. His name is Raphael. And he he's tells me, he says, do not confuse me with the angel. Because he knows there's a symbolist right there that just happens to be his name, you know. So I don't know why. Because the the lady that he associates with, she calls herself Andromeda, which sounds like the galaxy. I know maybe she's named after the galaxy. I I don't know, but that's what she calls herself. The lady that was on the ship, and they're connected. Uh, in fact, this uh, Raphael shows up every once in a while, and he's got this glare that just like melts right through your head. 
you know, the first time I ran into him, it's like, oh, whoa, oh, oh, you know, but he is 100% ET. And he's the one that showed up in the wall, the walk through the wall that handed me the little vial when I was sick and says, here, take this. You know, well, he didn't even say that, basically. He just handed it to me and says, you know what is like, you know what to do with this, you know. And so I took it, I drank it. I've never had a cold since. And they're the humanoid. Yeah, there's a humanoid. He was a humanoid. Those are, those are the supermodel, the supermodels of the universe, yeah, right? Yeah, he's got a gaze that when he looks at you, it goes right through you. You're like, he he knows everything about you right off the bat. I mean, you you can't hide from him anything at all. So if you have some material motives, he's like, yeah, no, I don't think so. And he doesn't really talk very much. So. Mm. Do you know where he's from? Uh, I just know him interdimensionally. You know, the funny thing is, I, I, I I'll go through these. Um, I went through this lady who does hypnosis just a little while ago through Dolores Cannon. She looks at me and says, well, why don't you ever answer, ask questions? Why don't you ask questions? It's like, I don't know. I just like, you know, maybe I'm naive or something. I just walk in and I have these experiences, which has also led to problems because when you're going into the lower world of the shamanic realm, um, if you do not take your spirit animal with you, then what happens is you're very naive to what's happening and taking place. And there are beings down there who don't work off the human psyche and they just do what they want to do. You know, and if you aren't on guard, you're susceptible to whatever whims they may have for you. For instance, one of the best the ways that they will deal with you is they'll come up and they'll bite you somehow. Okay, if they bite you, you're theirs. And that's their way of entering into you and being a hostile takeover, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, you just got to be really careful, especially if you go through this act of observation, which I have been through. And here's what observation is with me. Observation is not focusing. It's being totally unfocused. Okay, so if you're like Jane Goodall, I, I write about this as well. If you're like Jane Goodall, Good, Goodall in the jungle and you're studying chimpanzees, you're observing, but your act of observing is focusing on what these chimpanzees are doing, right? What they're doing on their day-to-day -day basis. My act of observation, what I have been taught is you forget about what the individual is doing and you just observe everything around you and you soak in and you connect with everything. So it's totally unfocused. Okay, so when you're going into these realms, if you're unfocused, then you're open to everything and they have their way of being able to find you just because you shine. And uh, they like that energy quite a bit because they don't get it very much, so. So these are would be darker beings in the lower astral realms? Okay. Yeah. Those, those when, MFers. When you do the shamanic travel, like that's like uh, solar retrievals, things of that. Nature. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. And you're going down to the those darker or lower realms to retrieve parts of people and, and parts of their soul aspects. And so you have to be wary as to that journey when you're in um, entering that those realms. Yeah, because um, it, it makes you really susceptible to pick up stuff. Uh, mm. if, if, even in the darker <clears throat> meditative states, it's I had this place I developed. I was studying meditation, right? And I knew that you go into this place and you protect yourself with light and all that kind of stuff. And so I had this place I developed way deep inside myself. It was on a beach. It was really beautiful. And I would go in there and I'd sit there for a half hour and just sort of soak up the really good energies. And I'd come back and I'd wake up. I'd feel really, really refreshed and ready to go again. Well, that's not necessarily a, a, a go-to safe place as I thought it was. And I found this out from other people who've been doing meditations as well, that you can be very susceptible down there. Okay, and uh, I met this being down there that just totally took me over, you know, and this was my safe place. I'm thinking, this is my safe place. How can this happen in my safe place that I have developed and I've put light in and 
put all this time in and I'd spent like literally seven or eight months in this place every day. I'd be going to this place, <clears throat> excuse me. And yet this entity enters and basically it was like a possession. They took me over. How does that happen? You know, because you're told that doesn't happen because you're surrounded by light and you're protected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, you just got to be cautious and careful about who you mean. Trains. I mean, it's, it's like, this is why people get training on these things. You don't just dabble. You, yeah. you know, take yeah. it seriously. How did you get the being out of you? How did you manage to depossess yourself? Oh. Or repossess yourself? <laughs> It took a couple of really, really practiced shamans to be able to go in and help me to uh, get rid of the thing. I could never have done it on my own because I didn't have the expertise to be able to do it. But there were a couple of shamans who kind of stepped in and helped out tremendously. And I would credit them for helping get me out of this particular spot because literally when they took me out of this spot, um, my head emptied out because there was times I would be going along before that and I'd he- I could hear these two different voices in my head okay say do this and one was do that and I'm, I'm trying to figure out okay now I'm a little confused here because there shouldn't be two voices in my head and I found out one of them was this individual that I picked up down there right and so when it was gradually just kind of taking over and um after the shamanic experience had happened, it bounced me back like about 20 years, literally. I mean, my head emptied out <clears throat> totally to where all I could hear was, it was just like a big echo in my head bouncing back and forth. And I thought I was going to go insane for a couple of weeks because I couldn't, you, you're alone with yourself. All of a sudden you're alone with yourself, which is hard to explain. And I, you get, like a thought and it'll just kind of bounce in your head and you know that you're all by yourself. And uh, it bounced me back 24 years to where I was literally walking into a place I'd walked, I'd worked 20 years before and says, Hey, yeah, I decided I'd like my job back. And he looked at me and says, well, can you do it still? I said, what do you mean? Can I do it? still? of course I can do it still. Right. And um, he says, okay, well, let's go back and take a look at your records. When did you work here? So it was about a year ago. You know, he's looking through my records and he's going, uh, no, last year, last year, two years, three years, four years, five years ago, six years. When did you work here? I'm, I know I'm confused because I'm looking, I'm saying, well, it was just last year. You know, he's looking back. He says, uh, oh, here you are. You, you Like 20 years ago. Can you still do this? And then I'm really confused because I'm looking at him uh-huh. and I'm going, 20 years. What are you talking about? You know, because I'm literally living 20 years earlier. You know, I'm pulling all the eight-track music. I mean, the cassette tapes and eight-tracks I have out that I still have. And I'm plugging in them in, trying to find a way to plug them in to listen to them. There's no way to plug them into because I don't have that equipment anymore, right? I just got the tapes. Wow. And uh, I come out of the office, and I meet my old supervisor, and he's bald. And before that, he had hair down to his shoulders, right? When I left, he had hair down to his shoulders. I'm looking at him. I'm kind of confused again. I'm looking up and says, what happened to your hair? He says, oh, I colored it. I shaved it. I grew it out again. I shaved it. I colored it. I grew it out. I'm like, what? (laughs) You know, because he looked older and everything. I'm like, no way, man. Mm -hmm. And um. I just continue off. I'm walking on my way. And after about two weeks, they actually call me back and say, Hey, yeah, we're going to offer you a job. Would you like to work? I says, no, I don't want to work there. You know, cause my senses were starting to come back. He says, no, why would I want to come back and work there? I says, I quit there for a reason. It's like, I'm not gonna, he says, I, I think you're a little local, you know, and they hung up the phone. I'm like, so it, this possession, yes, yes, I've heard of other people who've had possessions of this sort who have gone through the same thing. You know, and they're all alone with their thoughts because the thing that was possessing them was taking over and they have no, it literally just about drives you insane. Wow. Yeah. When, when you were kind of going through this period of kind of living in the past, quote unquote, did the memories of your son disappear? 
No, they were still there, but I was treating him a little bit different because he was older. So I was like, uh, I knew that he was my son, but I'm like kind of, he was off doing his thing with work and everything like that. So I really didn't see much of him. And it all kind of came back full force. But that job thing just struck me as really off the wall. Um, I don't know how to explain that one, you know, I'm pulling the eight-track tapes up, but I was able to keep a communication going on with him for whatever reason, but nothing else seemed to make sense at the time. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about, um, because that's, that's a whole shamanic underworld thing is um, its own episode. It's fascinating. (laughs) Excuse me. Um, would you tell us about your men in black experiences and then we want to hear about the mantis experiences after that okay the men in black is um <clears throat> i say men in black but those are beings out there that do this uh men in blackish type of stuff okay so and this is one of those incidences where yeah i was absolutely taken by the military uh what had happened beforehand was this individual shows up and asks me if I'd like to speak at the Rachel UFO conference. The, well, their UFO conference in Rachel, Nevada, which is right close to, you know, Area 51. It's literally the back door of Area 51. And I looked at the lineup and yeah, George Knapp was going to be speaking there. A couple other people. I think, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. You know, but I thought about it for a while. I thought, you know, you know the night before, we met him at a, we met the individual presentation. His name was Ike Bishop, who was doing these conferences. And um, he showed up at the Salt Lake MUFON meeting. And his, he was asked me if I wanted to speak. Uh, at first, I like, yeah, no, I don't think so. And then everybody kept egging me on. I said, hey, you ought to go speak. You ought to go speak. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll show up. I'll go speak. He says, great, we'll have you for two days. Okay, we'll have you for the Saturday, and then we'll have you for the Sunday. And um, <clears throat> there are three of us in the room at the time that I agreed to speak. I said, yeah, okay. It was one, two of them were my friend. One was the MUFON director. The other one was Ike Bishop. And the other one was a friend of mine who was also a shamanic practitioner. You know, very one that helped me with this um, experience that I was talking about earlier down the lower worlds. And I said, okay, great. So I agreed to that. And then nine o'clock the next morning, I'm at work. It's even earlier than that. I think it's more like about six o'clock as at work. And I happened to do a lot of work on the computers. I was doing uh, sales on the computer and taking a lot of inbound calls. And I started to get these calls. Now, you got to keep in mind, there's only like about six or seven hours between the time I said, yeah, I'll go ahead and speak. And um, the time that I went to work. Okay, so I'm showing up at work. I'm on the computer. The computer car starts fritzing out on me. You know, I see the screen, you know, kind of blinking on and off like it's having some issues with it. And get a kind of crank, couple crank calls. And I'm thinking, yeah, this isn't going to work. I'm starting to get agitated and really upset and all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> and uh, so I said, well, I'll just switch computers. So I switch computers and the screen just starts really going crazy. And as the screen is going crazy, I'm starting to get these frank, really, really crank sexual phone calls, right? I mean, it's just like these people calling in, they're propositioning me, saying, oh, you got a really nice voice, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, what kind of a line have I got right here, you know? It's just, this is a sales department. What are you calling me for like that? You know, so I said, well, I've got to, I'm going to get off the line. I'm going to go switch computers one more time. I'm going to see what's going on. So I started to get these. So I switched computers one more time. The computer just went out on me and the phone kept ringing. And I keep getting now this really, really, really bizarre, sick type of calls coming in. And I get really frustrated, mad. I pick up my headset and I throw it down on the computer. I said, what the hell? Yeah. And the minute I said that, I thought I've got to kind of compose myself. So I go back into meditative pose and this portal opens up behind me. And I could see this reptilian guy standing behind me. He, he kind of jumps through the portal. He's 
I don't know if it's a holographic projection is what I'm thinking. He's projecting us somehow, but he's standing behind me and he looks at me and he says, don't speak. I'm like, what the heck? What are you talking about? So somehow he knows I'm already signed up to speak at this conference at Area 51. Uh, and then he says, don't speak. I said, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm going I'm, I'm to going. I'm gonna speak. And I was trying to be really intimidating. So he kind of hunches himself up and he's already big intimidating as is. He looks at me again. And he says, don't speak. I said, get out of town, man. You know, I'm, and now I'm looking at him and I'm seeing behind him that there's a, uh, he's speaking, he's, he's projecting himself from this military complex someplace because I'm getting a very military look. There's a tile floor, it's a cave someplace. And, uh, there's some lockers off to the right hand side and he's standing next to these lockers and he's like, he's projecting himself to me. And then I see a guy walking behind him with a clipboard and he's got a white smock on and a blue a tie that's stuck into a blue shirt. And he's got a buzzed haircut. It's like, he's not noticing what he's doing. He's just kind of like, you know, looking at the clipboard as he's walking by. And I'm thinking, is he where's he at? Is he like at Area 51? Yeah, and he recognizes that I'm not paying attention to him. And then he just really hunches up and he yells at me. He says, Don't speak. I said, Get out. No, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm going. And where are you at? And then all of a sudden it just kind of folds in on itself and it's gone. Right. So I show up at uh, the conference. And I'm speaking the first day, everything is going really good. It's going fine. And I've got a two hour time slot I'm filling. So I'm speaking there. And then I go to bed that night and I have this, um, I wake up and there's these lights just shining in the room all over the place. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know, cause this is just lit up really bad. So I go over the blinds, I look in the blinds and I see a couple of military trucks out there and they got the big, you know, lights coming out like these Jeeps pull up and they got the lights shining off of them and they're shining around the compound. The, the, it was a uh, trailer. They had a bunch of trailers parked out there and then they have a little speaking stage, a convention center type of thing off to the side and a little alien eatery right there, which if you've never been to, you should go somewhere. That's pretty cool. And um they're running around doing something and I'm looking at them and I back up a little bit and said, damn, what is going on out there? Right. And then I get really, really sleepy and I sit down on the side of my bed and I just pass out. I just, I'm, I'm out. Okay. Um, the next thing I remember, I'm sitting in a chair in this small room and it's definitely military. 100% military. It's got the green walls, the lime green walls that they would have, you know, and then it's got these little asbestos green and white tiles on the floor. And off to the right hand side of me, there's a door. And right in front of me, there's a desk. And it looks like an old school teacher's desk of some sort, you know, it's like a, just a typical industrial type desk sitting there. And I'm sitting in a chair in front of this desk. And there's just one light hanging down from the ceiling, it's like, um, and there's two people sitting off to the side of me. I know that they're there, I can feel them there, and they must be military MPs or something that they're standing right there. I try to look up at them and they just like shift my head forward, says, nope, like, you know, they don't say anything, they just now redirect me and sit with their hands and say, no, you're not looking at us, All right? I hear the footsteps coming down the hall and there's that same guy I was looking at earlier through the portal and he's walking in, he sits down at the table, he picks up a pencil and he's banging the edge of the eraser on the table and he's saying, told you not to come and speak, didn't we? Told you is, not to speak. Is this the reptilian or is this the human that this you saw the, the clipboard? Human, this is okay. the human guy. I don't know where that reptilian guy is, he's not there, but. The human guy is bouncing the the colonel, whatever he is, is bouncing the pencil off the table. And he looked at me and said, we, we told you not to speak. Why did you come to speak? 
you know, and I'm not saying anything. I'm just kind of staring at him like with a smile on my face. Like, yeah, well, whatever. Yeah, he says, told you not to speak. And then there's this other guy comes out here in his footsteps. This other guy comes around, he looks in the mirror and says, uh, what should we do with him? He says, bring him back. Yeah. And they lift me up out of my chair. They you know, grab me my arms, lift me up. And I walk around the corner. The minute I walk around the corner, there's this little reptilian guy. He sprays me in the eyes with some type of liquid. You know, he just, there's a spray. He sprays me in the eye really fast. I don't even have time to blink. And then I'm just like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I wake up the next morning and I can't see. And I'm looking, you know, it's like, I, I can see, but it's like, I've got my sunglasses on and my eyes are pupils are really dilated and I'm having a hard time focusing and seeing anything, you know, I'm like, it's like I've been to the doctor, you go to the doctor and get your eyes dilated, same thing. My pupils are huge and I, I can't see and I can't really remember anything that had happened. So this reptilian dude, uh, this, this whole concept of, uh, don't speak, keeps showing up all the way down the line. In fact, my grandmother, well, I don't know what she is actually right now, but it's kind of a soul buddy now, I guess is what you would call her, that she died when I was like five, six years old. We were really tight. And she'll show up every once in a while. And when she shows up, there's a smell of roses that'll go out through the car, through the room or whatever, and then I'll hear her talking, yeah, which... It's kind of a novel concept in itself because of the whole reincarnation. That's another subject altogether. But anyway, she shows up and she'll, she told me, she says, hey, Don, they're after you again. That's what she'll do. She'll show up every once in a while. So they're after you. So her life in the heaven realm, I guess that's where she's at. I'm not sure. And the ET realm are somehow really connected as well. They, they know what's going on. And so she shows up and she says, hey, Don, they're after you again. And that kind of just follows you around, you know? I mean, every once in a while, they'll just show up and they'll make themselves known. And it's like, hey, it's like an abusive relationship. Yeah. It's your fault. You did this. Why did you do this? And we told you not to do this. Now it's your fault. Look at what's happening. And this is what's happening because it's your fault. And they try to make you feel guilty and bad about doing something by affecting your circumstances or the people around you. You know, I said, you could stop this. All you gotta do is just stop talking about it. Yeah, but they've kind of mellowed out here over the last couple of years, but there have been some really bizarre experiences where I'm just looking and I said, did I just see that? Did that just happen, really? Yeah, and it, it gets to the point where they can actually I don't know how they do it, but they interject themselves into other people. This is going to sound crazy. This is really going to sound off the wall. I wouldn't believe it if it didn't happen to me, but yeah. And um, these other people will react to certain situations. Like I ran into, I, I went up to speak at the Southern, I mean, the Seattle UFO conference one year. Okay. And right after I got done, I met these two guys and uh, in a situation and they, their personality switched and the minute I ran into him, they looked at me and says, I don't believe in UFOs. I'm, I'm just, this was an associate with something else that was going on as well, right? Which is their way of saying, hey, we know where you're at. We know what you're doing. Mm. You know, I says, I don't believe in UFOs. I'm looking, I'm going, what? Because it's really associated with something else that was going on as well, I'm thinking. So I don't believe in UFOs. And he said this right to my face as he walks up to me. He said, I don't believe in UFOs. And I said, well, maybe you should. And he's just screaming at me. He says, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm like, really? And then that same day, another guy walks up to me and he is totally 100% plastered, wasted to five sheets to the wind. He couldn't even hardly walk. I couldn't, he was very unintelligible. I couldn't understand what he was saying. And then he all of a sudden just kind of snaps out of it. And he looks at me and he says, I saw the accident and it was terrible. It was horrible. You know, it's kind of their way of threatening me and said, hey, you know, this stuff happens. And so 
I don't know if they're remote influencing. I don't know how they're doing it, but that kind of stuff has followed me through life. And I'm like, really? You guys are persistent, but it's not working very well. I don't really care what you think, you know, but I had to take a pause on it for a little while because it got pretty intense. And so it does do that with some people. It's like a there's this guy in Utah who had a, crop circle that was being developed in his field okay people look at me and said well you're not that special I said yeah you're right I'm not special at all I have no idea why they'd be doing this because I'm nothing really to I'm just an average Joe out there working nine to five jobs so why I didn't even have a nine to five job there for a long time you know so I don't know why they would be hassling me but there is this guy who had a crop circle he was a farmer he had a crop circle was being developed Okay, and it's like it got halfway developed and then it stopped. And then the next night, the bald light bulb showed up and finished it. And there's some residue that was left on the ground. He was out there looking at it, and there's some residue out there. And he picks up this residue, puts it in a jar, and says, Huh, I don't know what this is. You know, he puts it in the back of his truck and um, drives back to his house. The next morning, two men in black show up. He hasn't talked to anybody. You know, he called the sheriff the night before and says, hey, the sheriff, you know, this is what's going on. The sheriff says, well, we'll be out there tomorrow. We'll take a look at it, see what's happening, right? So, um, and it's a real community, so they really don't just suspect anything. So two men in black show up early in the morning, the next morning before the sheriff gets there. And they're questioning him about it. They say, well, don't talk about this to anybody, you know? And he's like, well, who are you guys? You know, it's like, in his back of his mind, who are you? Are you related to the sheriff's department? He says, no. But they do show up to him in his place and they tell him not to talk. He's a farmer, for heaven's sakes. What, why is this such a big deal that this farmer has a crop circle in his field? And so he goes down, the, he's driving down the road to his field to check on his cattle. He's coming back and something jumps in the back of his truck. Some little creature jumps in the back of his truck, takes a bottle and takes off. And this, this is a, a story that happened. It's like, um, why do you bother with a farmer or an ordinary Joe? Why aren't you bothering with some big wig in Washington or something, right? That's just the way they do it. I don't know why. I have no idea. Well, it's fear and clamping down on, you know, wherever there's going to be a light leak <laughs> to clamp yeah. down on the light leak. Yeah. And and I've definitely heard, I uh, was talking with Lorelai, one of our previous guests, about um, <clears throat> being able to co-op someone's consciousness and operate through it, and um, that there are people that can do that, and that is a thing. Um, mm -hmm. Before we, because we only got about 20 minutes left with you, only, uh, less than that, um, I wanted to see if Linda or Jason wanted to hop in before we talk about your Mantis connection. I just wanted to share my quick experience with MUFON. When I first saw my, my very first UFO, I called. And as I was answering some of the questions, I just kept getting a worse and worse feeling about what I was experiencing. Like everything about me was like, shut up, Linda. This isn't good. Shut up. And so I finally just said, you know, I probably imagined the whole thing. And I hung up. And within the next two weeks, out randomly, it would come up in conversations that I didn't initiate of people saying, you know, you need to be careful who you talk to and move on. Very you need to be I careful. Think, I think there's a lot more going on with it. I think it was probably bought out and compromised a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, I very positive. much and negative experiences with MUFON like you have. It's uh, up here with our MUFON group. I wasn't too pleased with how it went, but back when you have these kind of MUFON experiences a little bit more on the spiritual side, it seems to go better. Yeah, yeah. I don't like the MUFON organization as a whole. But. Well, and I, you know, I definitely got the feeling that there were some, there was some infiltration at the upper levels and that, you know, the people that were regional, you know, really had the best of intent, but that there was, there were people watching those reports. 
Yeah, that's probably what happened too with me. Yeah, that's, uh, I would agree. <laughs> Mr. Jason, did you have a, th a thought? I'm ready Good. for the mantis. Ready for the mantis. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. Would you let us know about your mantis connection, that experience, Mr. Don? Oh, that was like the highlight of my life. It really was. It's like I was so stuck in that for a long time because it was it, the energy of that had been building up for about a week, but I didn't realize it. And uh, we'd been up there the week before and visited a shaman up there, and uh, he did a ceremony. And um, it was really pr pretty intense. It was is really it just stepped the energy level up a whole bunch and then we came back and then the next week we go back up there again to this place it's not too far from skinwalker ranch it's up a place called uh fruitland in northern utah northeastern utah is up by vernal up by duchene area if you're familiar with the area it's up in that area and uh, we had this friend who had a little trailer that was there and we thought, yeah, we'd go up there and spend a couple of days, you know, and have some fun. And we went up there with a shaman who has had a lot of experiences with the UFO type of things. And uh, so he was also a partial astronomer, too, so he knew the sky really well. And we go up there, and we're just joking around. There's a little bit of drizzle. It's up in the high country. It's really up there in the mountains, you know, up around the 7,000-foot level, somewhere around there. So it's starting to drizzle a little bit it's summer like around the 24th 25th of july i remember that because we were having the big celebrations in the in the area and we went up there to spend some time and um, we thought well we want to have some sort of experience there are four of us all together and we thought well we want to have an experience we want to do something to you know actually have some sort of communication with some sort of entities because we we're all big believers and we'd all had experiences before and we thought, well, we'll get us all together and we'll see what what will happen, right? So we get up there and we're sitting on the porch and there's just a little bit of light drizzle every once in a while that hits, you know, so we've got our jackets on. I mean, it's not that, it gets a little cool up there at the nights, but it's not too bad. And all of a sudden the sky opens up. You know, it's like... Um, our intent was to have some sort of experience. And so the sky opens up and there's a perfect donut hole above us. You know, it's like just a perfect circle right over our heads. And uh, we're looking up in the sky, the sky, so there's just millions of stars up there. It's like, it's a sky we've never seen before. And the a friend of mine looked up in there and he says, I don't recognize any these star these stars i mean there's so many of them i've seen half this constellation i don't know what they are and he didn't recognize the sky at all and you can see this triangular ship bouncing you know it wasn't really big but it was up there quite a ways it was just kind of bouncing from side to side in the circle it would hit the corner of the circle and bounce back over like it was kind of clearing out the sky mm -hmm. yeah and um then we started to hear these like click, 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 you know, it's going around all over us here. You know, just three at a time. And we started to make out these shadow figures running up and down the road. And you could see their eyes were really big and they're about nine feet tall. And, uh, you know, these mantis, for lack of a better term, were running up and down the road, you know, and they would stop in the front yard and they would look at us. These, these shadow figure like things would look at us and they would take off running. You hear them click, click, click and running up and down the road. And um, the way that this was set up, they had to have an outhouse out back because <clears throat> they didn't have any way to have any plumbing facilities in the trailer, you know? So you go, there's a little trail that will lead you out back and you go out to, you know, do whatever you need to do on the outhouse. Well, as we walk, one of the two ladies that were there and say, hey, you know, come on, let's go, you know, run out back. And um, they were walking out back and all of a sudden you hear them giggling and laughing out there. And they were calling for us to come back around the back of the house. And uh, so my friend 
decides he's going to walk back there. He turns around, he walks back to the back of the house and I hear him yelling at me and I'm thinking, I'm just, now everybody's kind of tranced out and they're in such a high spiritual plane, you know, that we're just like, we must have entered an interdimensional type of a thing somehow. But I was sitting there staring up the stars because it was just absolutely gorgeous. No, it was like, I couldn't believe that they were just hanging over us. These stars were so big and so beautiful. And I'm staring up the stars and they're yelling at me to come out the back of the house. I'm like, at back of the trailer, I'm like, leave me alone, man. I'm just, you know, I'm admiring this stuff. I'm just like tranced out, admiring this stuff. I said, but it got so insistent. I said, okay, I'll come back out. I'll see what you got going on. So I walk back out there and they're sitting next to the edge of the trail. There's rocks going down the trail right there. And they'd stick their head out and they would laugh and they'd pull it back. And if you ever watch a ghost show, uh, the temperature will drop when a ghost comes into the area. It's the same thing here where they're reaching their hand out and the temperature dropped about 30 degrees, you know, well, not 30, maybe 20 degrees, right? The temperature dropped and they pull their hand back. I'm walking out, I said, what are you doing? They said, oh no, stick your hand over here, stick your hand out there. So I stick my hand out there. The minute I do, I could see, you know, a couple of praying mantis out there in the backyard staring at us and the temperature dropped like about 20 degrees. And it's like, oh my God, they're all over the place, aren't they? And so we walk around the back of the house and we sit down and we're watching all this activity that's going on and you see the sky up there and it was just like, you know, all this stuff was going on. I decide I'm going to walk out back and I'm going to make contact with these guys. I said, I want to see them open up. I want to see what they really look like because all we're getting is the shadows. I mean, you can see the shadows, the like shadow people, but you can make them out very distinctly that way, but you can't really see their full features. The details. Yeah. We want, I want details. I want to see what the yeah. details look like. So I walk out back and I say, show yourself. And all of a sudden, one of them shows up next to me. I could feel him next to me. And he shows up next to me. I'm walking up at him like that. I says, I want to see what you really look like. He says, are you sure you want to see us? I said, yes, I want to see you. I want, really want to see what you look like. He says, are you sure? I said, yes, please, just let's see what you look like. He goes, nope. And he takes off running. I'm like, this is like horrible marks type of stuff. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> What's the deal here, dude? You know, so I'm kind of confused. So I walk back around the house. And I sit down again. And one of the ladies walks out to the middle of the field or right out in front of our house, or right out in front of the trailer. And she says, I'm going to talk with this thing. So she walks out there and her feet literally lift like about three feet off the ground. And it's like, you can see her shoulders sort of shrug back. And like this thing is lifting her up out of the ground and staring at her in her eyes. You know, her head kind of flips back and she's like really out of it. And she slowly comes back down on the ground and she walks over and sits down. And I was like, well, she said, I was like looking into the stars, man. It's like, you know, really, really cool. I said, well, damn it, man. I want to have something like that happen to me too, right? So... I, I told everybody here, I'm going back out in the backyard again. I'm going to see if these things will manifest themselves to me, you know? So I go back out, I try again. I stand there and the same being shows up next to my side. I said, please show yourself to me. I really want to see you. And he places his, his wing-like arm over my shoulders. And when he does that, you could feel this blue... Like I was saying before, it's a blue electrical energy is the best way to describe it. Kind of flows down my shoulders and angles down my spine all the way down the bottom of my spine. And it's just tingling really bad. And I'm like, um, just sitting there. He says, no, you're not re ready to see us. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, when they do this kind of stuff, it just sinks in. You're just like, okay, they're 100% right, you know? It's like, oh, okay, whatever. And then you just turn around and you go back to what you're doing. So we turn around and I go back on the porch and we just sit there for like another hour, probably they're running around doing their thing and you hear them clicking and running up and down the road. And there's a road that's going by the side of the house. It goes up into next to this ravine up to up the road a little ways, you know? And um, 
they all of a sudden they disappear. And they disappear and the clouds kind of sink back in, slowly sink back in and the sky is gone. And everybody's just really, really quiet. And we're just kind of contemplating the moment. And then um, all of a sudden, all of us all at once jump up and say, bedtime. You know, like it was like, okay, there's no question. It's got to go to bed. So everybody couldn't get to bed fast enough, right? We're all running to our beds, cleaning everything up off the porch, running to our beds and, you know, can't get to sleep fast enough, you know? So I'm sleeping there and um, I wake up and I am just pouring sweat and it's like 40 degrees outside, right? And I am just pouring sweat. I am so hot. I pull the sleeping bag off and, uh, you know, I'm just burning. My body is literally burning up. feels like it's burning up from the inside. And so I go in and lay down on the bed with a window open and um, try to just chill out for a while. And by early morning, I will get like an hour's worth of sleep. You know, it's like something had just really affected my body bad. So this is one of those weird times where I decided I want to get, I want to see what's going on. I want, you know, because something obviously happened because I wake up in the morning and I've got gum, you know, pine gum all over the bottom of my socks, which I never sleep with my socks off, but they're just covered with pine gum. So I'd been somewhere and I'd done something. You know, so we went into this, uh, I found uh, somebody who's really good at this and we went into this uh, hypnotherapy session and what came out was just kind of amazing because what had happened was they wanted everybody to go to sleep at the same time so they could walk us up the road. Okay, so I woke up and I'm walking up the road in my socks. And that's where all the pine gum and dirt comes from. I'm walking up the road in my socks and I'm getting to the ravine right next to the side of the road. And... Um, there's this doorway, you know, this arched doorway. It's got this little clam type of uh, light on top of it, and it's kind of shimmering, but you can look through it, and there is this mantis being standing next to it, and he's inviting me into this door. It's a portal of some sort, you know? So we both walk into it together, and as we walk into it, we're into this ship. It's like we walk directly from that into the ship. And it's a triangular ship. And it's got a catwalk going from each corner into the center of the ship. And if you look down through the catwalk, underneath it, you can see an orange ball, which is like shining right there. And it's just floating right there, which must be their like plasma or energy source or something. You know, is what I'm assuming. And right up above it, there's a pedestal. And uh, on this, it looks like a little altar. And on the top of it, there's a red ball that you can place your hand like that. It's like a Spock thing, but it, it's, you can see it's kind of suited for the praying mantis type of thing, right? So, so I'm looking at it, what, what is this? He motions me, put my hand on it. So I do that, I put my hand on it and I see my life scenes pop up in front of me on a big screen right in front of me. Yeah. And I'm looking at him. So, well, what is this? What's, what is, what is this? And he studies me for a minute. He says, deja vu. And I'm like, uh, okay, deja vu. All right. Um, the next thing I know is we are, I take my hand off and the scene disappears. And the next thing I know is I've never gone into real big detail about what this, what was on the screen or deja vu was in it, but it's just like uh, your life experiences that you're going to run into every once in a while, you remember it and it'll be, feel like, you know, oh, I've been here before. Yeah. You know, like I knew I was going to move to Portland when I was 16, you know, to Oregon. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to move there. That's a, kind of a deja vu thing. Next thing I know is we're standing next to this great big door. It's a black door, and it's like about 10, 11 feet tall, and maybe about three or four feet wide. 
Okay, and it's on a ship someplace, it's still on a ship someplace. And the door slides open and we both go into this room and up on the far end of the room, there's this, it looks like a camera lens almost, but it's a scanner and it scans us and you can see this purple wave coming up and down my body. And again, I'm looking at him, I say, what's this? And he's kind of trying to, like he's trying to figure out how to tell me what it is. And he says, soap, soap, soap. And he's just really excited because he found out a way to say something. He says, soap, 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 soap. So it's have some sort of cleansing effect on my body, right? Um, as soon as that's done, the light stops. There's another door opens off to the left-hand side. I'm looking into this room. We're out in space someplace. I don't know where, but on one side of the room, there's this curved dome. It's kind of, it, it goes like a 90 degree angle and it's just made out of what looks like glass. You can see out of it, you know? And all you can see is just stars. I mean, just we're out there. I don't know where, I didn't recognize anything, but there's just stars out there. We're out in the middle of the universe someplace. And off the left-hand side, there's this kidney-shaped table. And there's, all together counting me, there's 27 people sitting around this table. That's a significant number, 27. Yeah. And whether they're me's or whether they're other beings from other places, I don't know. But in the middle of the table, there's this cone-shaped type of thing coming up, it's, and on, it's a rectangular cone that comes up to a point, and on the top of the point, there's a great big crystal ball. Yeah, and we're sitting there looking at this ball, and all of a sudden, you could see like the Kundalini flow from every individual, it flows up their spine, out the top of their head, it comes into this ball, and it kind of stirs into a great big fog in this ball, and then it shoots back up into each one of us, like we're all now connected somehow. Yeah. And so we're sitting there, everybody's sitting, and I'm standing for whatever reason. And uh, this being next to me, his name is Jerron, has, it doesn't, he, he's not involved with this. He's just kind of showing me or what's going on. The next moment, it skips to we're sitting on top of the ship. We're on a big bubble on top of the ship. He's standing next to me and we're looking out in the universe and he says, would you like to see? I said, yeah. And immediately when I said, yeah, everything disappears, including him, the ship and me. It's just, I'm standing out there in the middle of the universe by myself. And you could feel like uh, you could hear this tone is it's like a tone that's going through the universe it's it's really weird it's just like a musical note okay and it's flowing through and it's like there is a um the best way to describe this is if you had a wind blow through your body and it touched every one of your cells and it just blew through and you could feel the wind blow through your body it's kind of the same way that this happened. I could feel this tone just flowing through my body. It was the most peaceful, loving thing I've probably ever felt in my whole life. It was just like, wow. Yeah. And he let me sit out there, I don't know for how long. It could have been for days for all I know, but I was sitting out there for a while, then all of a sudden I'm back on the ship, we're walking through the portal, and I'm in my sleeping bag. Okay, and there's something about being on the ship in their environment that affected me physically because my body was just frying on the, like I said, from the inside out, it was just frying. You know, and it took like most of the morning for that to kind of dissipate and for me to feel better. Well, there was also that Kundalini amplification. It sounds like everyone's Kundalini was coalesced and then poured back out. So there's probably perhaps an amplifica amplification of the Kundalini energy. And yeah. that your body had to readjust to because it wasn't just your kundalini energy anymore you were now like in a collective that's my, yeah, my sense of it yeah um so. well mr don we are uh this was just fascinating we are a little over time but i still wanted to be able to ask you uh before we wrap up what is your final message from your heart to um the, our listeners uh to their hearts uh this whole thing is about consciousness and it's about like i said the selves it's about overcoming the subconscious self and connecting with that higher self 
and you do that, the DNA activations that everybody talks about actually help. It's part of it. But the other part of it is overcoming your fears and uh, allowing that spiritual self to kind of overwhelm the physical self, I guess, is how it, not overwhelm it, but to merge with it and to let the let that subcon the unconscious self take over. And you've got to be able to, so that you can stop coming back through this earth life and this, because when you get stuck in the karma of this planet, that's the whole bad thing about it, is getting stuck here in this karma of this planet, is you're kind of doomed to keep repeating it until you finally get that unconscious self taking over, that spiritual self, that light taking over and letting it do its thing. Yeah, a lot of people are scared of that because they're tied in the dynamics of the uh, this conscious self, which is you know the big thing right there. So getting rid of the subconscious self, learning how to observe uh, without fear, without judgment, without letting these influences of the planet take over. So it's hard. Yeah, I mean that it is a it's an unending journey and it's a uh, one one layer after one layer after one layer sometimes multiple layers at once but yeah. it, i think it just gets more intense it sounds from your journey it sounds like it just gets more intense as we go so i'm glad that we have forerunners like you so that we can tap on the shoulder and have someone to say i experienced this what was that and you're more than likely going to be able to give some context for it since you've experienced so so much well that would be my hope yeah yeah but uh yeah. There's a lot of people out there like me. They just don't talk about it as much. Uh, and I'm glad you have a forum like this. You can put it on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm going to flip this into gallery mode. Uh, and so uh, Linda says she's got a loud chainsaw action happening at the moment. Um, so I will do the exit. <laughs> Okay. Um, no worries. No worries. We'll do that. So um, thank you everyone for showing up. Thank you for all of our, all of our salon members, our uh, YouTube community, the live stream chatters. We appreciate you so, so much. You make everything so much more rich by your presence. Um, we've got all of Don's links down below. We've got Linda's, mine, and Jason's. So you can connect us with us there. And next week, um, oh, and also if you haven't, you know, please go ahead and like and subscribe always because it always helps us so much in getting the messages out. Um, it helps the channel, it helps the community. So next week, um, it's the 24th, so we probably won't have a show, but I'm also playing, we're looking at a raffle, or we've been chit-chatting about a raffle for hitting our 2,000 mark in our subscribers. So it's kind of up in the air. We'll let you know as we know, uh, as the week progresses. But other than that, um, thank you, Mr. Jason. Thank you, Miss Linda. And of course, thank you, Don. It's just been a fantastic show and um, so, so rich, so many more layers we can go through in uh, hopefully future conversations. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. All right, everyone, you take good care. We'll see you next time and have a great holiday if we don't see you next week. All right, bye. <laughs>